Well, hello everyone. I see we're getting people trickling in. Okay, let's see here. Hi, Tammy. Hey, Patty. Okay, I've got a buttload of information for you guys today. This, someone had asked me last week about um, some tools, uh, some ideas, maybe for gift giving or whatever, you know, some of my favorite tools. So I started looking uh, at my stuff and I decided, um, well, it just kind of morphed into like this humongous amount of tools. Uh, I am calling this demo my essential studio tools, uh, but it's, it's more than more than that. So um, I kind of went a little nuts and put a bunch of stuff together and I just tried to uh, print it all up so I could follow uh, the handout that I'm giving at the end. Um, and for whatever reason, my printer is not printing the pictures. So, you know, uh, all the good intentions just kind of went down the tubes. So I'll do the best that I can uh, with what I've got to work with. I just was trying to um, have an order uh, of, of presenting these tools in the way that I wrote the handout. So, um, you know, um, it, it'll be whatever, whatever it will be. So hello to everyone watching. Um, okay. So like I said, I went a little crazy. Um, I'm going to start off with some hammers that I like. Now, some of the um, tools I put where I got them from, and some of them have item numbers, but I just don't have time to um, write every single item number and where I got them. Number one, because I don't remember where I got a lot of them. But for those that I do remember, I will write them down. If, um, if all else fails, you can do a search on Google with the names of the tools and you can find uh, places. But with the handout, it will be easier for you to navigate that, okay? So I have some higher end and some middle of the road uh, products that um, should be able to work for just about everyone who's doing this sort of thing. Um, the things that I have are certainly um, not limited to all the things that are out there. You may have different brands, different models that you prefer. So, um, you know, whatever I'm using doesn't necessarily mean that's what you have to use. You may have other things or you may like other things or other people may recommend other things. Uh, I'm just showing you today things that I have in my studio. So um, I'm gonna start with hammers. There's a lot more hammers than this that I have in my arsenal, but um, these are the ones that I tend to use the most for what I do, but there's certainly a lot more available. So I'm gonna turn the camera down and hopefully you'll be able to see these. I'm trying to follow along on my laptop to see that I have things in the frame. Unfortunately, I can't turn my phone in the horizontal position uh, for some reason uh, when I try to do that, I get a message on the phone saying I can't do the live in the horizontal mode. So there's that. So I'll show you what I can. Um, I just have a few of my favorites here. Well, these are my favorites. Uh, I have uh, a weighted rawhide hammer. This one is a new one that I just got, so it's not really worn in very well. Um, this is, I believe, a seven, it's either a seven or an eight ounce 
mallet. They, they are heavy. They've got like lead inside of the, inside of the hammerhead here. Um, I just switched over to a weighted hammer because um, I had some without the weight in them and someone recommended that the weighted hammers, rawhide hammers were much better. So I got one that I thought that I will use more often. So this is the smallest, I think there were three, maybe four sizes total of the rawhide hammer and this was the uh, the lightest weight. And it's still a substantial weight. I'm sorry you can't uh, know what that feels like exactly, but that's one tool. Uh, this is a chasing hammer that I like. This is just an inexpensive um, chasing hammer. They have, they come in all different kinds, uh, different makers, um, but this is just a very inexpensive low end model. I think it was like eight or nine dollars, something like that, maybe. Um, maybe it was a little bit more, but not much. But they, they come in uh, a lot of different makers. Uh, then I just have a little nylon hammer. I don't use this much, but it's nice to have one for the times that you need one. This is a true strike. I know you can't, the, the words are backwards on the phone, but uh, this is a true strike. Uh, strike brand by Eurotool. They have a whole line of these uh, more inexpensive tools that are comparable to the uses of a frets. Uh, frets tools are pretty top of the line as far as um, the quality goes. I only have, oh, maybe half a dozen frets hammers. I don't have a lot of them, uh, but these are the two that I use the most. Uh, this is an embossing hammer. I guess they're both both embossing hammers, but this one does the little dents, uh, little hammer dents really nice. Uh, this one's a little bit wider on this end. This is narrower. I use this one a lot, and I use this one uh, a lot as well. This is more of a straight line. This is a little bit narrower, and this end is a little bit thicker, okay? And this is another True Strike. There's a whole set of the True Strike hammers, which are supposed to be um, sort of like replicating what uh, frets hammers are, the sizes, the shapes, um, and, and they're a much more affordable uh, line of tools. I haven't used them a ton, but so far uh, when I have used them, I've been satisfied with them. So that that is a, I don't know, I think there's maybe eight in the set if you want to buy the whole set or uh, you can buy them individually. So that makes, um, makes that end a little bit more affordable. There's also uh, a Wubbers brand that has uh, the same shapes and types of hammers. So that's something um, that you can look for too if you're looking for this type of hammer. And then I just have a uh, inexpensive brass hammer, just a short ham hammer or handle uh, that I use when I'm stamping uh, metal stamps, letters, uh, designs, that sort of thing. I'll use just that little inexpensive kind of a standard hammer. Uh, it could, this one happens to be brass, uh, which is supposed to be a little bit kinder to your tools um, and, and make the strike a little bit easier. Oh, but it also makes little specks all over. Um, or you could just use a regular standard hammer too. So yeah, uh, jazz, <laughs> we love economical, of course, because there's so many, there's so many tools that, you know, you would go broke if you had all of the things, you know, in all of the name brand, um, tools. And it's just like, I can't do that. There's a few that I'll 
I'll spend my money on. But um, for the most part, I have to choose like a middle of the road type of thing. I don't want real low end and I can't always afford the real high end. So when you find something that's kind of in the middle of the road, uh, that's that's uh, uh, pretty nice to be able to find that. Okay, so that's hammers. If you have questions, just um, you know, ask them uh, in, in the comment section. Uh, I have a lot of stuff to cover, so I'm going to kind of move along with things. Um, but, you know, like I said, this morphed into more of showing you my tools, uh, the things that I have, and some of them I'll be able to show you what I use them for, but I certainly can't do that with all of them. But if you have questions on any of them, I will try to address those. Okay, so let's move on. So that's hammers. And like I said before, all of this, the photos, all of this will be in your handout. So you can always refer to that if you want to print it up. You don't even have to print it if you save it as a file. You can just look it up because it takes a lot of pages and a lot of ink if you are going to actually um, copy all of that. Um, the next thing are pliers. Now, um, I have, I discovered Tronics brand a couple of years ago, uh, and I really like them. So I've been kind of uh, adding a Tronics plier here and there uh, to kind of um, get a nice, a full set of, of ones that I really like. I, I like the way these feel. Uh, these are... Um, you know, they cover your whole hand. I think they call them ergonomic. I'm not sure. But these are the flat nose flyers. And I have two pairs of them because I do a lot of chain mail. So uh, I have found that I have less hand fatigue when I use pliers like this. So um, these are a nice addition. If They are pricey, though. All the Tronics brands are relatively pricey. So... Um, you can find less expensive uh, pliers. These are the Wubbers. These are really nice as well. I use these quite a bit. I use these almost exclusively before I found the Wubbers, but there's a lot of things I like about these. Uh, I like the way these feel as well, although they are a shorter handle, but I use a chain nose, a flat nose, and a round nose and if you do chain mail you'll need two pairs of flat nose it's just much easier to work with two pairs of flat um, you can use the chain nose and a flat nose but it's nice to have that extra width when you're um, working with your uh, jump rings and you tend to slip less if you have two pairs of the uh, flat nose Okay, and then I have a pair of long round nose pliers. So you can see the difference. Round nose pliers come in a lot of different lengths and widths. Um, the width to me isn't so important like in a, in a short nose, but in the long nose, I like it. I like the width in here because when I'm making clasps, that extra uh, uh, circumference is nice, you know, to, to make a nice loop in your, uh, like a say, for example, for an S clasp, I think uh, they make a nicer size S clasp. So in my arsenal of these hand tools, I would have a round nose, chain nose, two pairs of flat nose, and a long round nose. Okay, and if you could afford it, I would have them all in Tronics, but that's up to you, but I just want to show you, and they come with these nice little covers so you can keep them um, from getting all scratched up. So those are the pliers that I use. So 
initially, you know, I was asked to do something like for people that um, wanted to ask for certain gifts or get, get something for themselves, special something for Christmas. Uh, but I couldn't limit it to just a few things. So I just thought I'd put it all out here. And then um, if you're going to buy a gift yourself something or have someone gift you something, uh, you've got a lot of stuff uh, to choose from and uh, all different price points as well. Yeah, the Tronics are very easy on uh, arthritic hands, Dawn. That, that is so true. And the handles are very comfortable. So, all right, so that's those. Next up are cutters. And I have a variety of cutters, all useful. Um, I had bought the Lindstrom's a long time ago, uh, thinking that this was like the top of the line, and, and they're good. They're good. I, I can't fault them, but um, there again, these are pricey. Uh, I have discovered these Italian flush cutters that work pretty well. These are a lot less expensive. When I'm talking pricey, I'm talking anywhere between 40 45 to maybe $65 for a pair of pliers. So it does, it does add up. But like I've said many times before, this is an accumulation of stuff that I have gathered for over 20 years um, in of the time that I've been doing this stuff. So it's not like I got it all, you know, at, at one time. It was over a process of many years. Um, where do I buy the Tronics? I happen to um, get them from the Beadsmith, but a lot of companies uh, carry them. Uh, and, and the Beadsmith is, you know, a wholesale account, so you have to have an account for them. But um, I believe there are lots of other jewelry suppliers that carry them. So I'll, I'll see what I can do as far as uh, referring where you can get some of this stuff. But like I said earlier, I, you know, it's just so time consuming for me to, to find every single thing uh, and, and send you a link for it. So, oh, Jazz said she went directly to the manufacturer. Okay, well, there, there you go. That's that's a good source right there. Okay, thanks for that, Jazz. Okay, so then I have the Tronics cutters. This, this was the first pair that I got. Um, I saw someone, I think it was um, on the website on Beeducation some years back uh, that they were using these to cut little wires when they were doing their wire wrapping. And... Um, and I bought a pair because I was always having those little points. Well, they weren't flush. So I thought I would take a chance and buy a pair, and I have not been sorry. These are razor flush cut uh, cutters, and this is item 5223 Tronics, and I've also got um, 5222. They're both razor flush. I really can't see the difference. There has to be a difference since it's a different number. But what it is, I, I couldn't tell you. But these are wonderful for thinner gauge wires to get really close to cut off that little extra. So, yeah. Okay, so that's, those are my favorite for small wire. Uh, then I'd probably go with the Lindstrom's and the Italian flush cutters. And then these um, I got on Amazon, but I also initially saw these on Beeducation. Uh, Lisa calls these the fat daddy pliers, but um, I found these on Amazon and um, that'll also be in the handout. This is for a heavy, heavy duty pliers for heavier, heavier wire. They are a wonderful addition to your tools. And then I just have some inexpensive metal shears. I use these quite a bit. 
Uh, I think these were from Eurotool and they're probably less than $10. So those are kind of nice to have. Okay, so that's what I have in my cutters. And all right, let me see where I go next. It would have been so nice if the printer would have printed the pictures so I could just stay in order. All right, the next up were hole punches. And I, I've touched on some of these things in others, other uh, demos that I've done, so I'm not gonna go into like a ton of detail, uh, but these are the ones that I use the most. There are, uh, the Euro tool has two different hole punches. One was specifically designed, uh, if you're making your own wire rivets, this is the four hole punch. And it gives you um, the measurements on the bottom here for 18, 16, 14, and 12 gauge wires. So you can punch your holes and they will match the size wire that you're using to make your rivets. Even if you're not making things with rivets, these are good hole punches. So there's that, but that was specifically made for that reason. And then there is the three hole punch, and this is a 1 16th, a 1 8th, and a 3 32nd hole. And you use a hex wrench or Allen's Allen wrench, whatever you want to call it, um, to uh, twist down these screws to make your hole in your metal. And the really nice thing about these is that you're not limited. You can push this in as far as you need to, um, whereas if you just have a standard two-hole punch, uh, you can only go in as far as you're allowed. With, you know, it, it's just the cutout is very uh, shallow. So you could not, if you had a round disc or a larger disc and you wanted to put a hole in the center of it, you couldn't do that with this. But if you're making uh, holes that aren't, you know, that don't require you to have that much depth, the two hole punch is great. This has a, a 1 16th hole punch, and this is a 3 32nd on the other end. Uh, but the nice thing, like I said, is you're not limited. If you have a large piece and you want to put a hole, you know, somewhere further. Okay. Yes, Mary Ellen, this is for you. <laughs> this demo is for you since you asked so nicely. So, yeah, I hope you uh, get a lot out of it. All right, and also these, well, you could mount these too, but there is, I have a, uh, a tabletop uh, adjustable vise that you can use these for your hole punches, especially if you're doing a lot of... Uh, production work and you need to make a lot of holes this keeps um, everything um, well it's just handy however you want to set it up it has a the a, a pivot this ball and socket kind of a so it allows you to pivot your uh, tool around in the position that you want and you can put it, the jaws have some kind of a nylon coating and you can just put your tool in there. Of course, I don't have it lined up really well. Okay, you can put your tool in there and just go to town. So let's, let's just say we'll put a, let's put a big hole in this one and just twist this around and just twist until you feel it break through the metal and then you can unwind it and then you have a nice 
nice hole there nice clean hole and you can just keep on going you can you can position this however is comfortable for you but um that's that's pretty neat so that i use this one a lot and it's uh, I don't have it mounted anywhere stationary because I move things around all the time, but that's kind of neat because you can just move it wherever you need to. All right. So that's that. And then I have um, a couple of punch pliers. I, I don't use these a lot, but uh, once in a while they come in handy. And there is... Um, the ones that I have, I have a 1.5 millimeter and a 1.8 millimeter hole. Uh, and this has a longer reach in here, so, so that's kind of neat. goes a little further than a standard two-hole punch does. And these also come in shapes. This is a square, and this is an oval. And to be truthful, I very seldom, if ever, use these. So... Uh, I guess I grabbed them not realizing that I grabbed them and I didn't get the 1.8 out, which I do use. So anyway, so that's another option with the uh, punch pliers. Sometimes these come in pretty handy, the, the 1.5 and the 1.8. Scrap these. Unless, no, no, I shouldn't say that, but I just don't use those for anything. All right. So that's punch pliers, or hole punches. There are other things on the market too. There's a Euro punch that's a big gizmo. I don't have one of those, uh, but I know some people that have them and they like them. So like I said, this is not just, you know, like what's out there. This is just what I have of some of these different things. Then I have some metal forming pliers. Um, these are, well, I guess I forgot to get the other pair. I've got a couple of sizes in this. This is the larger. This is a wrap and tap uh, tool that you can make uh, jump rings or form your metal, uh, a, I don't know, like rings and things like that. Uh, you can take, just got some copper craft wire here. I don't use these a whole lot, but um, a lot of people have them and like them. And it's got three graduated sizes, so you can make uh, your uh, your coils like this. These are a little stiff. I think I need to oil them up a little bit. Probably just sitting around too long. So you can just feed your wire in here and make a coil like that. And then there's different sizes as well. So I can never remember how to start these off. That shows you how much I use them. Where's my cutters? But they are, that's not a cutter they can be useful and there you go And there's also, uh, by Weber's, Weber's has a whole line of different metal forming pliers also. This, I think, is their medium size. And you just are wrapping the wire. This is a wider side here. And then you can wrap them on the smaller size. And it's got a millimeter size, but unfortunately it's not marked on the pliers, which would be nice uh, to help you remember what sizes those are. But, you know, one is 
a little wider diameter than the other. So you can make, if you just need a couple of jump rings, you can make them like this. Uh, and then I would use those, um, the Tronix razor flush cutters to disconnect them and uh, get as flush cut as possible to um, make jump rings with. But when I make jump rings, I normally use my jump ring system because I make a lot at once. But this is great if you're just, you know, need a couple of rings and don't want to lug all that other stuff out. So, so there's that. Then there are larger metal forming. These are uh, better for bracelets and large rings, not rings that you wear, but like hoopy hoop kind of things like hoop earrings you could use that so this is not i mean if i had heavier wire this would be more appropriate but if you wanted to make hoop earrings you could certainly use that size or the smaller size but they're pretty easy to maneuver I'm just kind of going through things quickly so that's a nice size as well okay and then I have um, half round flyers I don't know that they really fit in this category or not but I didn't want to exclude them these are uh, pliers that are half they're rounded on one of the tine of the tines of the plier and the other one is a flat and this is nice when you're doing uh like the inside of a ring you can kind of curve it um and keep that shape you know as you're going around like say if you're doing a ring a, a finger ring you can get in there and turn it um and it just helps you keep the shape all right so those are metal forming pliers that I have. Uh, they come in, Wubbers has these. They have, uh, like I said, these. These are not Wubbers. I don't know what these are. Oh, these are from the Beadsmith. So these are a knockoff uh, plier. But you can get, uh, the Wubbers brand has all different sizes for these. They have a real skinny one like this. Uh, a fatter one they have squares uh, I believe they have ovals as well uh, and even triangles they they have a, a really nice line of pliers and they're affordable okay so all right so that's that then files um i am rather file um, um not ignorant but uh, not that knowledgeable on files i have some uh that are useful i i don't consider myself like a a full-fledged metalsmith that sort of thing. I kind of dabble in stuff. And um, people who are highly skilled may have a whole bunch of different things than I have, but some of these are pretty basic. And they also know why you use which file for what purpose. Um, I can't tell you all of that stuff. I just, I just can't. Um, but I do have a few that I feel are essential. I have um, two flat files like this. I have a number two cut and a number four. Um, and I have a half half round, which is good to get inside of um, round objects like rings and things like that to, to smooth inside. This is a number two cut. Um, and sadly, my grandson got a hold of this and was wailing away on something before I realized he had it. So this is kind of worn out right here. He was a lot younger when he did that, so he didn't know. 
and I didn't see, so can't blame him. And then I have a couple of round files. Uh, this is a Grobit uh, number four. That's nice to get in tight spots into holes and different things to kind of file those out. This is just a little bit skinnier. This is a zero. And then I have some needle files, which I've ordered some new ones because I've kind of trashed these with metal clay. And, um, and I wanted to get another pair that I could dedicate uh, to my metal work. So a little, these are the mini needle files. There's also, these are like, I don't know, four inches, something like that. And standard uh, needle files, I think, are around six inches. So, um, so those are nice to get, uh, to have, especially if you're sawing and you need to get in tight areas. These little mini files can get in there a lot easier for you. Then there's simple emery boards, just regular nail file kind of things. They have they come in different grits. Uh, these are handy to have, uh, and they're very inexpensive. You can get these at uh, Sally Beauty Supply, or you can get them on Amazon. Actually, on Amazon, you can get them real cheap, um, you know, different grits like this. And then uh, I always have an awl handy. I, I have several of these. This one I've kind of trashed, but I've got some that have a real fine point. They have their uses. They come in handy. You should, everybody should have one of these in their tools. Uh, and then I have some bezel setting or um, stone setting things in here. I have a bezel pusher and I have a couple burnishers, metal ones. These come in several different lengths. There's one even longer than this, but I like this little short guy. I just find it easier to uh, to hold on to this. But, you know, a lot of times you use the things that you learned with and, um, and you kind of stick with them. But I also got a set of these acrylic uh, setters that are... Um, really nice. I, I don't use the, the wider one as much as I use the narrow one. These are from um, Flow Studios, Flow Studio Supply. You can get, they have a website on Etsy. Uh, nice, nice bezel setting tools, or burnishing tools. Um, and then tweezers, you should always have some, some tweezers. I kind of trash them because I, I, hold them in the flame sometimes. I shouldn't, but I do. Uh, but you should get some fairly decent, uh, a couple of pairs of those are nice, tweezers. Uh, another thing is, this is a great tool. This is a miter vise. And for the longest time, I, did, I bought it because I saw people using it and I thought, oh, I should have one of those, but I never really understood how to use it. And there's still probably more to it than I know. But um, when you're setting or when you're making a bezel to set a stone, um, you want to make sure that your ends of your bezel wire um, are absolutely flush and come together. So that way um, you get a good join, good seam. And if you're not... If they're not cut exactly flush, um, you're not going to get a good seam. So this is uh, very useful. And you just put this in your miter vise. There's a little, there's a little square here that you put your metal up against. I don't know if you can see that or not, but as long as you're right up against that metal, then you screw this down so that metal can't move. Screw it down tight. Well, that didn't work. That's because I didn't have it in right. It's hard to do this and show you. 
make sure that you don't stray so that it doesn't move and then you would use your file and whatever metal that's uneven that's sticking out you would file this till it's flush with the little tool here and you can feel when it doesn't grab it anymore when the teeth of this file doesn't grab this and this is nice and flush you can't feel any metal sticking out then you have a perfectly flush end and you would do that to the other side as well you know whatever length you needed for your uh, bezel and then that way when you join them together uh, they will be flush and you can solder them and it'll be a success and you'll be happy so that is one of the uses for the miter vise and you can put wire in here you could put you know generally when you cut like big chunks of wire like this you're going to have an uneven edge because your pliers weren't flush cutting and uh, you would do the same thing you would put that in there you would open this up to fit that wire and set it against that little stop that's in there and close it up and then you would do the same thing with the file and file that over so that is these are relatively pricey too and these do more but i don't know what else they do so uh, i can only tell you and you want to try to keep these clean too um they're they get all those little filings inside there so another essential tool is a can of canned air and you can get in there and knock all those little uh, crumbs out, those little silver or copper crumbs in there, and uh, keep your tool in good shape. All right. So I do truly need to um, get better versed in this little tool. Uh, I'm sure that uh, it, it's handy for other things as well. But what I just showed you is what I use it for. And um, there again, these are not inexpensive. This, there, and there's several different kinds. Um, I want to say I got this from EuroTool, and I want to say it's around sixty dollars. But there's also one that's pricier. But I, for my use, I thought this would be just fine. So. Um, yeah, Jess, there, there's just so much to know. I mean, I know some, but I, I certainly don't claim to know it all. I, I just don't, you know. But for what I do, you know, this stuff is fine. All right, so I'll set this aside. Do that. Then um, just a brief thing on saws. This is another thing that I'm not fond of, but um, but I'm trying to make myself become better at it. I, I, I really pretty much suck at uh, sawing with a jeweler saw. This is just a standard German uh, saw frame, and uh, this was the first saw frame I bought, and it's okay. There, I can't really find a fault in it. I, I would like the handle to be a little bit more comfortable, but um, like I said, for as much as I saw uh, one of these German saws, I, I, these are very inexpensive, under $20. You can get them. Um, and then I bought, this was a long time ago. This is an old model of the new concepts uh, jeweler saw. And I thought this would make me a better saw, but you know what? It doesn't matter what saw you have, I don't think, as long as you practice and you become better at it. That's what's going to make you a better saw, not, not just the type of saw. You can be more comfortable with a better quality saw. There's no question with that. But unless you practice and do this often, um, you're just not going to get the skills, you know, 
that are needed to do some beautiful uh, piercing work. Uh, you would use a lubricant on the saw blade. Uh, there's different brands, and uh, this is just happens to be Rio, Rio Grande's brand, but there's other cut lube, and now there's a new new one out by Peppy Tools called Burr Butter, which I haven't tried yet, but um, I'm going to try that. That's more of a, a, a liquidy, pasty kind of stuff as opposed to a waxy uh, material like this is. But you would just... For those who don't know, you would just run your blade in the uh, in this wax to lubricate it slightly before you do your sawing. And then there's this nifty little uh, saw blade case that's a relatively new thing that's come out. It's called a Kerf. Um, I believe it's a 3D printed uh, case. Uh, and it has all the sizes of uh, all the different kinds of uh, saw blades that you use. And it opens just where you want it to, so then none of the other blades fall out, which I think is a great, great plus. And then they've got the closed section so that when it's closed, nothing falls out. So that's kind of a handy-dandy thing. Okay. So that's the saw blades that I have. I've been leaning towards getting a haymaker uh, because I've heard such good things about them. But um, I want to try to improve my sawing skills before I buy any other saw. So, so there's that. Um, Donna says, if your wax becomes crumbly, just pass a torch flame over the top lightly to melt the wax and bring it back to a usable condition that's a great idea because every time i open this you know it just like the it, it kind of falls apart so yeah uh mary ellen i do have some nano blades in here i i kind of marked them uh with a sharpie but it was kind of hard to do on this plastic but i did buy a few of the nano blades and uh I, and i'm still breaking them because because I suck at sawing. <laughs> so that, um, hopefully that will get better. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I've read so much about the nanos that I did buy them, but like I said, I haven't, I just haven't, um, put the time into sawing like I should. So, um, I, I think if I got better sawing, I would notice a much better difference with the blades as well okay so that's that next up is my disc cutter well I'm gonna do this first since I have this tray right here I have some dapping blocks this was the first one that I started out with, was just a small little little block, which is great. Still works fine. Just depends on what I need it for. Um, there are some larger ones. I do have one that's a, maybe about, I don't know, it's a little bit bigger than this for a larger size disc, maybe the size of uh, this disc right here, that bowl, I mean, right there. It's a block. And these come with a wooden uh, pestle or punch, whatever you want to call that, uh, which are fine. And then I like this flat uh, wooden bowl because a lot of times I'll do um, enamel pieces or I like to make little copper dishes. And uh, having these sizes, uh, this is a great, great tool to have that. And then I have a metal dapping block and then I have metal punches as well it came as a set uh, and they are just metal versions of these these are nylon and I've been using these a lot more they're just easier to deal with um, they're not as heavy and they work just fine so uh, you can even buy uh, Harbor Freight has a set of 
I think it's 40 or 48 punches and the dapping block and uh, the punches are metal and uh, you can you know like I said you can get that set they have tons of different types of dapping blocks but you know this is what I have and it serves me just fine so um, these are nice and I think they're a little kinder to the metal uh, like if you have things that are embossed or you know um, roller printed I'm, I'm not I can't say that for a hundred percent sure but uh, I, I think <clears throat> you're less likely to obliterate your design with these nylon punches <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to get a little sip of water here. And, you know, when you're doing these, you want to pick, depending on the size disc that you're placing in the bowl, you want to um, find the right size disc or bowl for your disc. So you put the appropriate punch in in the bowl here so as you work down you move down you want to make sure that that you you've got the appropriate size otherwise you're going to be getting lines you can actually get lines on your uh, punches and that's not a good thing because that's going to transfer over to other pieces <clears throat> all right so that's that like I said, I'm just touching on this stuff. I'm not really showing you how to how to work with them all, but um, just showing you different things. If you don't have them, I'm enabling you. Okay. Uh, and then I've got my disc punch. I try to keep some of these things um, in containers with those little um, moisture desiccant bags you know just to keep the moisture out this is an old version uh the peppy tools version disc cutter uh the one that they make now is round it's a round unit um it, and it's quite nice but this one i probably got i don't know around 2006 something like that so i've had it a long time and it still works great so um, to use that, I would just put this on my bench block and put my metal in and put my appropriate punch in. But first you lubricate it with um, some of the, this is the cut lube. And you just run that around. It saves, uh, it saves the edge keeps it sharp keeps it from becoming dull I should say it that way so there's different um... yeah Mary Ellen they are a, a little spendy but I'll tell you um, I've never regretted spending the money on on my hole punches or my disc punches uh, they're just a, a, a good quality very good quality and Peppy stands behind everything too so you know if you had a difficulty with anything I'm sure that they would take care of you um, well Donna if your Peppy disc cutter is still working for you I don't know do you have the older model like mine or you know they're um, I don't know I, I use this it's been a workhorse for me I absolutely love it Oh, I forgot about um, bench blocks too. Anyway, that's that's the round uh, peppy disc cutter that I have. I also have a Swanstrom, which is a round one uh, that I bought. Um, I don't know if I bought it before or after I bought this one, but it it has one whole size larger than this. This is, I believe, this is a what is this? This is a seven eight. Oh, this is a one inch. That's the size on that. And the Swanstrom, I believe, is one and a quarter inch. They have one more, one more size larger of the disc. So that's that. Let me find the lid for this. 
Highly recommend. Um, then bench blocks, steel bench blocks, they come in a variety of sizes. Uh, this is a four inch. Uh, I also, this is a four by four. Then there's, I think, a six by six or six by eight. Uh, a two by two, a small one, and I like to put them on these rubber blocks. They just absorb a little bit of the shock a little bit better and also helps keep the noise down when you're pounding. So that's kind of nice to have that. Uh, I also have a horn anvil. And honestly, the only thing I use this for is when I am making rings, um, Usually the stack rings that I wear, I will put uh, the ring on here. If I want a texture, then it, it's a little, it's a little dicey to hold on to it, but you can do it because I do it. Um, you put that on there and take your texture stamp or your texture hammer at the, and uh, just put your design on it, turn, you know, as you're doing it and it keeps everything nice and round. So that's how I use this one. It's nice to have. Um, okay, so that's that. What else? Let's see here. Oh, well, I don't have all of these things on the table, but um, uh, oh, okay. Move these things out of the way. This one's heavy. I have all these trays because when I had my my shop, um, and I we were doing a lot of bead work too, so um, I would put everybody's work with a um, with a bead mat on top of here, and everybody had their own little workplace, so. These are um, handy to have. I've used them for so many different things. Okay, so then I have some mandrels here. Uh, I started off with just a wooden bracelet mandrel. Um, but honestly, if you can pop for a, a steel one, I think they hold up way better. This has an attachment that you can uh, put on your workbench and keep it stable so you don't have to hold it. Um, this was a, an attachment that I got from Rio, and it just uh, attaches to a thing that has a slot in it, and you put this in there, and then that way your hands are free. You, you don't have to hold on to this. So there's that. And then, uh, so for bracelets, and then this is uh, a hoop mandrel. This is nice for making hoop earrings. And rings too, but it doesn't have a grad, it doesn't have the size uh, marked on here. But I use that mainly for hoop earrings. And then um, a ring mandrel, and this has got all the the sizes marked on here. So this is just a regular steel mandrel. These come. <sighs> You can get into really pricey ones, and you can get into really cheap ones. Uh, the cheaper ones will get dinged up uh, fairly easily, depending on how you use them. Uh, when I do my stack ring classes, everybody gets one of these and a chasing hammer, and then they uh, pound their texture on here, and they can get dinged up over time. So I don't like to spend a whole lot of money on those but they are essential to have if you're making rings. Okay, so that's that. Um, getting inundated with things. All right, then I touched on, well, I didn't touch on it. I was more thorough uh, two weeks ago when I did the rivet tool thing. And this I'm just going to uh, just touch on for anybody who didn't see that. Uh, these are rivet tool uh, placers to, to place rivets that are pre-made. You can buy them in different 
lengths and different uh, color wire or metal. They have aluminum, brass, and copper. They come in all different lengths according to your project needs. And uh, there's the original by Crafted Findings. And then uh, the Beadsmith has a knockoff brand called the Easy Rivet Tool, which I have found works probably just as well as the other. Um, so I would recommend either one of these and different size, a nice assortment of different sizes. You can also um, use a center punch if you use one of these eyelets. You can. Uh, make your this is a 332nd. This is what I talked about uh, a couple weeks ago when I did the rivet demo. That I like to use the uh, 332nd eyelets for a hanging hole in some of my copper pieces or um, my enamel pieces. And this I just think finishes finishes them off a little bit nicer. And I should have had a sample here. But I don't. Where's that piece that I cut a little while ago? Oh, what did I do with it? Oh, it's probably on the tray that I had the hole punches on. Anyway, you can punch a 332nd hole with your hole punch and place that in there and then take your, um, you'd be on a bench block and then take the center punch You take the center punch and a hammer. So you're in your metal. Remember, there's a piece of metal there. And just tap this very lightly, and it will start to curl the, the little end of the rivet a little bit, just a little curve. And then you can take uh, the ball peen end of your chasing hammer and then continue to, uh, in a circular motion, tap that down because if you if you excuse me if you hit that rivet the walls of this rivets are very thin so if you hit it a little too aggressively you can just split that that rivet tube in there so you don't want to do that you want to just tap it gently just to start getting a flare in there and once it flares then take that ball peen end and then you can tap it all the way around um, and it will set so that's that's a nice little tip there that you can do easy enough these little center punches are very inexpensive so you could do that all right and you can always if you didn't see the rivet tool demo you can go back a couple weeks ago in the um uh video section uh, and and find that and you can watch the whole thing all right so there's that and then there are um, oh this I also touched on um, I think it was last week when I did the charm bracelet and this was the uh, jump ring system that I have I forgot the mandrels there's always something I forget. And this attaches to your flex shaft. This is an old version again. Uh, this was made by Dave Ahrens in Arizona. I don't believe he's with us any longer. Uh, but Kevin Potter took over his portion of the business, of this business, and now makes these systems. So they're still available. They're a little bit updated. Um, but they... Um, you know, they, they are wonderful for making lots of jump rings. So this attaches in your flex shaft, your blade in there. This is a little safety cover over here so you don't cut anything else. And um, that runs, you have your coil of jump rings, and that's attached. And then you just... Just light them on down and it just cuts them all beautifully that you can see in um, last week's demo too if you want to see a 
demo of this in use. Okay, so I would highly recommend if you don't have a jump ring maker and you like to do chain mail, I would say this is the way to go because it gets to be very expensive and tedious to buy all the different size jump rings that you need to make a project. Um, that To me, that's worth its weight in gold as well. Uh, what else do I have? I have more. Wait, there's more. Um, oh, it's behind me. In the soldering department, I have a standard th uh, third hand. This is a basic one. These are great to hold on to things. Uh, I also have a GRS brand of a double third hand. This is also pretty awesome because you can maneuver these uh, into whatever position you need to hold on to things as you're working. Uh, it has a solder board on the bottom, but I tend to put a uh, solderite board on top of that. Where is that? I generally will work on a satellite board and you know it, it just it's just easier for me you don't have to go down as far and it works well you don't have to have it on a turntable um, sometimes that turntable gets me in trouble sometimes because things will move on me and uh, it's also always at a spot that I don't need that to happen. So that's, you know, that's the way it is in my world. So this is a nice, nice option. Uh, I believe the beadsmith has a knockoff brand of this as well. Um, so that might be something to look into. Um, I do like the swivel the rotating thing to keep your um, solder board on. All right. That, and as long as we're talking about, well, hang on just one second. I always keep a pair of utility pliers, what I consider utility pliers. Uh, these are just from Harbor Freight, I think they're two or three dollars that I pick up hot things with. I would not solder without them because I'm a klutz. Um, this probably doesn't fit into this category, but this is a ring holder that I really like. Um, this is called Peg Assist, and um, I think this is a Euro Tool product, and that holds on to small pieces. Uh, very nicely you can just put that piece in there shove that little uh, part in there and then you can hold on to it holds on to your piece and you can file or do whatever you need to do like on the flex shaft and you don't have to worry about getting uh, your hands get hot while you're working so this is kind of a nice um, a nice option to use that. Like I said, all these things are in the handout, so you can review those later uh, if you want to go over this stuff. All right, and back to the solder boards. I like to use the solderite board. Uh, they, you can use both sides. This is the soft board, I believe. Uh, they come in soft and hard. Honestly, I've never used a hard one, so I don't know what the difference is, unless that might be a hard one that's on the GRS, uh, but I don't know that for a fact. But anyway, I like that uh, you can swivel this around, turn it as you need it. Uh, I also have the charcoal block uh, that has the holder as well on a swivel. Do you need it? Probably not. Um, it's just a nice thing. 
nice little extra thing. This uh, charcoal block is pretty shot. Um, you always, when you get a, a charcoal block, you need to put binding wire, wrap uh, binding wire around it, tie it off. So that way, these blocks are notorious for breaking up. So uh, the binding wire kind of helps hold it all together for a while. But it's time to get a new one for this. And I generally buy the hard. They come hard and soft. And I generally buy the hard. Um, then there is also a solder brick. And that also has a swivel holder, rotating holder on there if you want to use that. Um, that sort of thing. You could probably make your own. They sell these things like at the hardware store that you can attach to the bottom of tiles and different things. Um, just as a thought. Okay. So that's, this is a messy, messy part. Ugh. Okay. Uh, where else do I need to go from here? These break too, if you're not real careful. Um, but you can... You can use, and I have used, all the sides of it, too. You know, when they get shabby, you can stand it up. You can turn it on its side. Uh, you should be able to get a lot of use out of one of these. All right. What's up next? Okay, i got to put this out of my way here. I'm going to have one heck of a mess to clean up when I'm done here. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, all right. I also use uh, a Euro Tool mini drill press, which I don't have on the table here. And it will be a picture of it will be in your handout. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's there. I also have my flex shaft here, and I also have a Dremel, and I and I only have I only use the Dremel when I travel because it's just easier to pack up, and it's usually on things I'm not doing uh, a lot of uh, rotary. Um, refinement or things like that. So the Dremel is just fine for that. Um, so that's that. Oh, uh, I also wanted to show you, this is uh, another very useful, uh, these are very useful items to hold your pieces down when you're soldering. Uh, these are called hummingbirds. They are made by a um, uh, a fellow Facebook uh, metalsmith. Uh, there, his name is uh, Eli Gamini or Gahim. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but I've got his name in the handout as well, and that helps. Hold your pieces in place while you're soldering so they don't get away from you. So you just, whichever side, he's got a whole bunch of different uh, configurations. And honestly, this is the one I use the most. But, um, you know, like I said, there's probably different reasons for the different shapes. But uh, this is a very valuable tool, in my opinion. So uh, you might want to check that out if you don't have any. If you send him a Facebook message, uh, he will get back to you. He's very good about um, getting back to you on uh, purchasing. Um, okay, then we have, this is random stuff because I couldn't put all this stuff on trays. I ran out of trays. These are my two favorite uh, torches that I'm using. This one is just a micro torch. It is uh, a Ronson brand 
uh, and you can't get this one, this particular model anymore. They seem to switch their stuff around a lot, but it's basically just got a very fine flame, and I like it for that, especially when I'm doing metal clay. I don't want a, a tremendous amount of heat, so uh, something like this, a creme brulee torch, a uh, little micro torch, these are really nice to have for that. And this is a more recent, um, maybe in the last year or two that I've been using. And this is just um, canned butane fuel. And it has, it just comes like this. You can buy this at in the camping section, usually by Coleman stoves, uh, things like that. You can get this on Amazon as well. And then there are torch heads that you buy to, you know, to use with it. And there's two brands that I'm aware of. This is Euro Tool brand, and this is a Sterno brand. I I've, don't really see much difference between either one of the brands. I just thought I would try both out to see how they are, just for comparison's sake. And so far, both of them are working very well. And then this has a nice big bushy flame. I can even enamel, uh, torch fire enamel with this uh, flame and a tripod so uh, and I didn't put the tripods out but um, that is this is a very handy handy item works really well so I can't say enough good about these but you have to be careful with them okay so that's my spiel on torches it's not a lot all right then we get into magnification and safety. And I will do, well, I'm going to do both of them because I got both of them here. Um, magnification. An optivizer is a nice tool. It comes with different uh, strength lenses, so you can switch those out. You can get a model with a little light on it so that you can see a little bit better. Uh, you know, shines the light on you. This is something you have to wear on your head. So I'm not fond of it because of that, but it actually works quite well. So you have to be able to see well to do a good job. So uh, that's really important. Then there's another... Uh, magnification system that also comes with changeable lenses and it also has a light on the front of it like that so that's kind of a neat thing uh, if you can get used to wearing it <laughs> that is another one of my issues uh, I know people that wear these they love them uh, and that's fine but I just have a hard time getting used to them but it's an option. These were pretty inexpensive, maybe around $20 on Amazon. Uh, and then there is the dollar store magnification of choice of mine that I just wear over my glasses already. And I know that looks hokey, but uh, you know, that's just, it works for me, so I do it. And so this is not a fashion fashion contest. Uh, in my world, so uh, I just try to use what works for me. But honestly, you can get these at the dollar store for a dollar. Um, you can also buy, you know, like a three pack or five pack or something like at Walgreens and pay a lot more money. And for what you use these for, the dollar store is great. And they come in all different magnifications as well. As far as safety goes, you should always have a pair of safety glasses. Uh, even if you wear glasses, you really, you know, if you're working on things that objects could be flying, sparks could be flying, or little metal filings could be flying, it's good to protect your eyes. You only have one set of those, so you want to protect them. Um, another thing that I like a lot is just a very inexpensive safety, safety shield. And I got this on Amazon. It comes with two pairs of frames and I think six different uh, disposable uh, plastic covers or shields. 
Um, I'm still on my first shield. I've used this a lot and these were very inexpensive as well. When I'm using the flex shaft and I'm using like a, um, uh, some of those wheels like pumice wheels and different things, little, little bits and crumbs are flying out all over the place and they're always hitting me in the face. Even if I have safety glasses on, I don't like things, um, coming at me, you know, getting in my hair, getting on my collar, my neck. So having one of these uh, helps a lot. Inexpensive. I use a lot of just plain face masks when I'm working on things like um, when I'm using steel wool and you get all those little fibers and filings when you're, when you're using the steel wool. I don't like uh, I don't know, it makes me like choke, you know, so it's like, I, I don't know if I'm actually breathing it in or not, but I found that if I wear a face mask, that doesn't happen. Uh, and if you want to do one better, uh, then you would get one of these uh, P95s. These filter out a little bit more. This is not a respirator, but it's a whole lot better than one of these. Uh, when you're working with a lot of dust particles. So that's um, kind of a safety safety thing because you've only got one set of lungs, you only got one set of eyes. Uh, you want to take care of those things and not create other issues. All right, let's see. Do I have anything left? Oh, um... I did that. Oh, rotary tumblers. Um, I have a lore tone and I also have a, um, a hobby rock tumbler that I bought at Michael's probably 20 years ago. And I actually bought it uh, for a different reason. I was tumbling some glass. I wanted to try to replicate sea glass. So I bought that and honestly, it works great. It's still working really good. I know they've changed the models since I bought that one, but um, I just put some stainless steel shot in there and it doesn't hold much though. It can't tolerate much weight. So for just uh, small items, uh, not heavy items. I'll use that little rock tumbler. Otherwise, otherwise I will use my Lortone, uh, which is my printer was crapping out on me here. So the color is not great, but, uh, it, that's a rotary tumbler. Harbor Freight also makes one that's very comparable to this. Um, the, the Lortone is a lot more expensive and I know people that have the Harbor Freight and have been very happy with it uh, for a lot less money. So that's a consideration if you don't have a tumbler. You will also need stainless steel shot, uh, which some of the, uh, well, I know Eurotool sells it. Beadsmith does not. Um, I'm sure you can get it like places like Rio Grande or Auto Fry or Contenti. Uh, there's other uh, jewelry making supply houses that will carry that. So um, that's important. And then I use a little squeeze of the Blue Dawn dish liquid uh, to shine up my stuff. So uh, I, that, I also have um, a hydraulic press. Oh, this is my rolling mill here. I have a peppy rolling mill. I really like it. Um, it is a 160, uh, it's a 160, and I got it from Peppy Tools. It's great. Uh, also, I think maybe I'll take the camera, I mean my phone, out of the holder and show you a couple of different things, but you'll have to walk with me. Let's see here. Okay, um, things are a mess too, so let's see here. This is the rolling mill that I have right here. 
That's it. And this is just the flat rollers. I don't have the rollers that uh, do the wire. Uh, I figured I would never do wire, so I didn't need it. And I like having this extra width of the rollers. So this is a really um, handy model. I really like that a lot. I hope you can see that. This is one thing I have the disadvantage. Oh, I think you can see it. Okay, so that's that. Walk over here. This is the uh, mini drill press, Eurotool mini drill press, which is very handy to use. I have um, a jewel tool, which I have not uh, really worked with much yet. Um, I know that they're wonderful to have. I've heard a great many people um, admire them quite a bit. I don't know if I have you get, have it in here. Maybe I'm too low. Okay, so that's that. Um, and then I have my hydraulic press, which is a homemade. It's a homemade press. My girlfriend's husband made it for me. Uh, he really uh, never had made anything like this before. And I think he was really reluctant to do it, but he did it um, to make his wife happy <laughs> and to make me happy. But, um, you know, it, it has its limitations because it doesn't have a real deep area for me to put a lot of the uh, cool extra stuff that like Kevin Potter sells with different bracelet formers and, and different formers like that. Uh, I can't really get them in because I don't have the depth, but I can cut uh, pancake dies real well in there and I can do impression dies uh, without any problem. So uh, if you could, if you're considering to get um, a hydraulic press, uh, Kevin Potter's your guy at Potter USA. He makes great presses, um, and someday, someday I hope I will own one of those. Um, and this is my bench shear. This I got from Eurotool probably about 10 years ago. And this is a 7-inch uh, plate, so I can put a piece of metal 7 inches across. And it has... Um, I don't know, it's a workhorse. It's been really good. It still cuts just as, as well as the day I got it. And it has guides on the back, so if you want to make um, production pieces a certain size, you can set up these guides so that you can put in your metal and you can, like if you wanted one inch squares, you could just keep feeding them in and it would cut it exactly the size that you need. So that's kind of cool. So, I think, I think I've shown off uh, everything that I use the most of. There are other things that, sorry, i got to put this back in the holder. Uh, there are other things that are available and that I use, but uh, not that often. So, um, I was thinking initially that I would do a demo on the hydraulic press at the same time as this, but this was a lot of material to cover just for one session. So uh, I may do the hydraulic demo next week, you know, to, to just show you how that's used. Um, I'm not the best at it, but I've, I've cut a ton of pancake dies with it. And, um, and I love it for that. So it's a very useful, the press is a very useful tool if you're making lots of stuff. So, do we have any other questions? I have to find out why my um, uh, program or my handout didn't print the pictures. It printed the words, but it didn't print the pictures. So before I... Uh, Put the file in the group. I want to make sure that it is working right. 
So um, if anybody um, downloads it and tries to print it and there's any issue with it, let me know. I have an old, everything I have is old. Well, I shouldn't say everything, but a lot of the stuff I have is old. Um, <clears throat> um, I have Microsoft Word, but it's an old program. So it may not be compatible with uh, whatever word processing program you have. Uh, I know someone mentioned that they couldn't open up the... Um, the handout and I can't this this program is so old I can't make a PDF if uh, if I could make a PDF file that would probably eliminate that issue but if you have problems with it let me know and if nothing else maybe I could uh, email you the handout if you're not being able to open it well I don't know if that would work either though because you still have to open it I don't know. I have to think about that. I may have to break down and get Office again, a new, an updated version. Um, let's see. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of went off, um, course, like I said earlier, kind of morphed into a, a much bigger demo than I had originally thought about. But I thought, you know, if it if it helps you to figure out uh, what you need to buy if you're in the market to buy something, you know, uh, I, I'm happy to help you in any way I can. It's just um, there's just so much and there's and there's a lot more. Oh, I, I didn't even mention the um, uh, fume trap. The fume trap is another great thing. Um, if, especially if you're working with paste solder, you need to have good ventilation in your work area and the fume trap, there's a picture of it in the handout. The fume trap, um, you know, has, uh, available additional filters that you can buy because they do wear out after a while. So that's kind of a nice thing to have um, also, you know, I, I would find that to be a fairly essential, uh, tool because I am downstairs in my house and I only have one, op one window, well, two windows that I could open, but they're not convenient, but I have a great exhaust fan. And then I use, um, just a regular circular, you know, box fan you know, to help kind of push the air through, but ventilation is very important. So, um, you know, you might, you, you need to have that. I mean, if you're in an area that you can open up windows and have some airflow, that's really good. But if you had an exhaust fan, that's even better. So, um, um, yeah, you know what, Marianne, mine, my exhaust fan looks like a regular uh, household range uh, fan, but it has a different motor in it. It has a much more powerful motor, and I use that. Uh, I initially got that to use for my lamp working because you have to have uh, a good exhaust system for that, and it works really well for that. So when I'm doing a lot of soldering, I have that on as well, and that helps. Um, All right, Jazz uh, want to know if I work with, um, I haven't really worked with an inexpensive bench shear, except uh, I did have that, oh, I forgot the name of it. It's, it's a bench, oh, I guess you'd call it a bench shear. Um, and I think it was maybe $150. I got it from Contenti and it, it, it just, it's like a strip, it cuts strip. Well, it cuts, it cuts pieces, but it has a tendency to curl the metal just slightly. Um, that's the only, um, 
the thing. I don't know. There are some more inexpensive ones, but I, I haven't had experience with them. So um, I know Rio has uh, different price points on theirs. Uh, they're a good company too. So I would think if you had any trouble with that, um, you know, you could return it or exchange it, something like that, possibly. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Tammy, you're right. I mean, some of them, some of them, to me, that just wasn't worth it, that one that I had, because I didn't like that curling that metal like that. And uh, I don't know. I guess everybody has their own opinions on stuff, but um, I just wasn't thrilled with that. So I don't know if there was anything else. I've forgotten it, but I'll try to do the the um, uh, hydraulic press demo next week with the pancake dies and some impression dies, uh, just so, uh, you know, in case you haven't seen any of that before, it will give you a clearer understanding of what the heck I'm talking about. Um, yeah, you're right, Marianne. Some things you can't skimp on. It, that is really, that's really, really true. But I, you know, it's all a process. You, you have to, you, it just takes time and money. You know, there's, um, there's just so much out there. But I've always been of the theory that you buy the best that you can afford. Um, but that's not always the wisest thing because if you find that you're going to use something repeatedly, you probably would have been better off just spring in the extra money uh, for a better one instead of having to um, replace it. So, uh, hey, Jennifer. Yeah, the Rio shears, I, I've heard good things about them, but I just, I haven't used it, so I don't know. All right, well, I don't know. I don't cut real heavy metal with this. I think you can cut up to 14 gauge with the one that I have. Uh, but I have never cut it. Um, I think 18 gauge is, is the thickest I've ever cut in there because I don't really use the other uh, uh, gauges. So um, I guess it's all about what you need, you know, what you're going to use. So, okay, well, I think I've taken up enough of you guys' time. Uh, I hope I didn't confuse you instead of help you in any way. Because there was a lot of stuff thrown at you. But like I said, you can look over this <clears throat> on the uh, handout or replay. And, uh, you know, and, and like I said, I have addressed other things uh, in previous demos too. So, uh, you know, you might be able to uh, catch up with some of those and learn a little bit more. All right, guys, uh, have a great rest of your day. I will see you back here next Wednesday. No, Tuesday. Uh, next Tuesday. I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing one right before Christmas or not. Uh, probably, but um, I just uh, have to see what I've got going here. With the holidays, you just never know. Stuff comes up. All right, so I'll see you in the group, um, and thanks for being with me. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye.